Hello friends, I'm Pastor Steve Lobb and I just want to thank you for taking time to join me today as, as we get together every week and we, we share some, some scripture and a message. So let's get into it. This morning's scripture message is coming from the book of Mark and we're in chapter 8 and we're going to read verses 27 through 38. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And this is the Word of God for the people of God. Pray with me, please. May the words from my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be not only acceptable, may they be pleasing to you, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture title is, God meets us where we are. Peter gets it right. Peter gets it right when he calls Jesus the Messiah. But he doesn't really seem to understand what that title really means. When Jesus starts to talk not about the road to glory, but instead the one that leads to the cross, Peter rebukes him. And Jesus rebukes Peter right back. Which might cause us to question our own understanding of Jesus. Because Peter's definition of Messiah might be the one that, that we'd prefer as well. Peter, we, and just about everyone else probably want a God who heals our every illness, provides us with financial prosperity, guarantees our security, roots for our sports teams, and, and generally keeps us happy, healthy, wise, and safe. But that's not exactly what Jesus seems to offer. Instead, Jesus points to a God who, who meets us where we are and in our vulnerability, our suffering, and our loss. A God who meets us in those moments when we really need God, when we all had worked for, hoped for, and begged for in some cases, but, but don't get what we want. And we realize that we're quite simply mortal, incapable of saving ourselves, and, and desperately in need of a God who meets us where we are. This means that we don't necessarily get the God we, we might think we want, but instead we get the God we need. Will Willimon tells about a friend of his who had hit rock bottom, spun out of control, and, and crossed the median heading the wrong way at 100 miles an hour. 
he fell from his prestigious place as an attorney to the, to the depths of alcoholism. He came home one day to, to find his family, his pastor, and three of his closest friends all sitting there in his living room. And it wasn't his birthday, but maybe in a sense it kind of was. He's now on his way to recovery thanks to a, a loving wife and children and the good work of AA, but especially because our God is a God who meets us where we are, when we really need Him, whether we realize it or not. I had always gone to church, the man told Will, but always, in the back of my mind, I thought the church was for losers, the weak. But you'd be amazed at what I've learned about God. Like what? Will asked him. Like so many phrases I've heard all my life, suddenly, They've become real to me, he, he replied. Like what? Will asked again. again. Like, take up your cross and you can only find your life by losing it. By hitting rock bottom, I've met God, said Will's friend. So in our gospel lesson, Jesus, or so far in our gospel lesson, Jesus has been talking only to the disciples. But after his encounter with Peter, Jesus calls the crowds to come closer and listen up. He then takes up the question of the Christian life, stating plain and simple that those who want to follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross. But we need to slow down a minute here because all too often we view Jesus' language of cross-bearing and denial through the lens of, uh, let's say, Weight Watchers. You know, have a little less of the things you like. Don't overindulge in the things that make you happy. Cut enjoyment calories whenever possible because they're not finally, I don't know, they're, they're not finally Christian. But I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about at all. I think instead, Jesus is saying that the life that has been packaged and sold to us isn't real life. And we need to die to those illusions and be born into the abundant life Christ and God wants for us. Here's the thing. Many of us tend to think that life is something you go out and get, or you earn, or, or you buy, or you win. But it turns out that life is like love. It can't be won or earned or bought, only given away. And the more we give it away, the more we have. In fact, it's only when we love others that we most understand what love really is. In the same way, only when we give away our life for the sake of others do we discover it. Somehow, in thinking about how to fulfill the needs of others, our own deepest needs are met. It's the mystery of life and the key to the kingdom of God. That's one reason why becoming involved in hands-on ministry is so important for our spiritual lives. Volunteering to serve others, wherever and however we can find ways, that's, that's so very important. I ran across an interesting story that was written by a person named Kyle Childress some time ago. In fact, it talks about a different pandemic from from several years back. Kyle shares the following. A good while ago, back in 1991, our, our small struggling congregation was faced with caring for some men with HIV and AIDS. It was controversial. We were small and, and didn't know if we were going to survive as a church or not. We were desperately trying to attract young families and and here we are talking about caring for men with AIDS. We couldn't come to any resolution and we were afraid of our church dying. But we knew that there were some particular men who were sick and alone and who needed someone to help them buy groceries and, and take them to the doctor. So we started there. We knew that Jesus wanted us to do at least this much. Over time, one small step at a time, our care expanded into creating a new organization, putting together worship services of prayer and healing and becoming friends with people 
we never dreamed ahead of time we could become friends with. Was that following the way of the cross? I don't know. At the time, it, it seemed to be the hardest thing we'd ever faced. We had little doubt about Jesus wanting us to care for these sick and dying men, and, and we became so focused on the many small steps that, that we rarely looked up to see if our church was dying or, or if we'd end up on a cross or not. Twenty years later, we're still here, although we're still small. We didn't die, although we buried many good friends who died from AIDS. I do know that, that we don't panic as much when, when Jesus starts talking about taking up the cross. We're more likely to cinch up our belts and ask, okay, where do we start? Taking up our cross is not about dealing with, with some normal suffering or, or problems or parts of human existence. That happens to everyone, every day. When Jesus took up his cross, what did he do? He chose, he chose, mind you, he wasn't forced to carry out the ministry that God wanted him to do. That is what taking up your cross means. It is making an active choice to live into the ministry that God has called us to every day. I think it also means breaking free from the, from the small box we trap ourselves in when, when I is the center of our universe. I think it's what Jesus is getting at when he talks about trying to save your life and losing it. He said that, in fact, the only way to truly live is to give yourself away for the sake of others. When we get trapped in the prison of our own self-interest, our own wants, or what I deserve, it becomes a place that robs us of life itself. Think of Jesus, who is himself the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus' commitment to God was so complete that he literally gave up his life for it. I think one of the reasons why early Christians cherished this very challenging teaching of Jesus is because they literally faced the same fate. The persecution they underwent for their faith, in many cases, put them in a place where they had to choose between their faith and their lives. And when the time came, many of them chose to, to go to their own deaths for the sake of the life and love God offers us all. They'd experienced something that was worth everything. Have you? Jesus calls us all to take up our cross and follow him. Jesus calls all of us to choose between the life this world offers and the life of the kingdom of God, literally between heaven and hell. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first thing which all Christians must experience is the call to let go of the attachments of this world. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our new lives in Christ. When Christ calls a person, he calls them to come and die. And in doing so, we become free to live. And Jesus is calling people every single day. The call is immediate. It's here. It's now. We must respond one way or the other. Remember the rich young man who came running up to Jesus, asking him how to, how to get eternal life? Jesus said to him, Go, sell, your, sell all your possessions and, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. He went away sad because he had great wealth? How radically strange this one sentence sounds to a world obsessed with money, fame, and power. He was sad because he had great wealth that he wanted to hold on to more than he wanted to follow Jesus Christ. How many people are sad because of the things that, that have them in prison to this world? How many successful folks 
in the worldly sense or are not experiencing real life, true freedom and salvation? How many unsuccessful folks are not experiencing real life, true freedom and salvation because they're running after all the wrong things? Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. No one passes from death to life apart from Christ. We live in a world that is so messed up, so unhappy, so lost. And the Son of God has come into this world to save us from the results of following it. The sadness, the loneliness, the darkness, the lostness the hell. All we have to do is forsake all else, take up our cross and follow Christ. When we're giving up the rotten ways of this world, we really aren't giving up much when you stop to think about it. Now the devil would have us think otherwise, but it's true. And what we're gaining, well, it's worth everything. Because in following Jesus to the cross, we are also following Jesus to the resurrection. And in doing so, we find that the way of the cross is none other than the way of life and peace and love and freedom. God comes to us as one of us and calls us to follow. And when we respond with obedience, we learn who we are by learning who Jesus is. And we are most fully ourselves when there is left less of self and more of God. When we embrace the will of God, however painful, daily, hourly, continually it might be. When we move forward in the way of the cross toward the resurrection life. Actually, Paul tells us that those who are in Christ have already been resurrected in Him, even though we are still living in this world. That's because we go from spiritual death to spiritual life as we become born-again members of God's kingdom. We all have all kinds of crosses in our worlds. They can be found in jewelry stores made out of gold and covered in diamonds. But in Jesus' day, a cross was one of the ugliest things in the world. It was a device for torture and death. It was the most horrible shaming tool the Romans had at their disposal. A person carrying a cross had been rejected and cast aside, sent off to die by the government. They were considered the biggest losers in life. And following a crucified Messiah would link the followers to such a shameful fate in the eyes of the world. Maybe that's why Jesus said, If anyone is ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel, we'll save it. Let's think about it for a second. What gives you the greatest joy in life? What creates for you the deepest sense of purpose? When do you feel most alive, most true to the person you believe God created you to be? My guess is right now you aren't thinking about something you bought or, or even earned, but rather of something that was rooted in relationship, in acts of service, and even in acts of what the world calls sacrifice when you're caring for another person. Self-denial and cross-bearing are not about being less happy, but about discovering the real and abundant life. A kind of life the world can't even imagine that comes in and through merciful love and service to God and to other people. This is what it's all about. Have you found this yet? It is available to anyone who will follow. 
Amen. Well, that concludes this week's scripture and message. And as always, I hope there's something in there that, that speaks to you. I, I hope God is, is touching you right now and, and just asking you, take up your cross and follow me. And, and you understand what that actually means. It just means a life in and through Christ. And the joys are not something that I can articulate or explain. Words just won't cover it. But when you do it, when you're there, you'll know it. And you're going to feel a peace and a joy and a love that is beyond all understanding. I hope you're all well out there. I hope you had a good week. I hope this coming week is, is equally as, as good, if not better. And uh, as always, stay connected with each other. But more importantly, stay connected with God. Bye for now.